All right. <clears throat> I have a feeling they start me at 9 o'clock no matter what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know. I might be right. I might be wrong. I'm not sure. All right. Um, we're talking about forms, and we, uh, it, it's important, I think, to understand <clears throat> you know, why we're doing this, why we're doing forms. And for the most part, again, you know, there, you know, it's hard to make sweeping generalizations, but for the most part, what forms do is they provide uh, dynamic server-side code with the input, with the parameters from the user so that it can do their job. Um, so like in Google, um, you provide the search term that you want. So Google can go do its thing and retrieve the results for you. In Angel, you provide your username and password so that Angel can identify who you are, make sure your credentials are, are okay, and display your classes and display them um, according to your role in the class, i.e. a student's um, screen will look different than an instructor's screen uh, for the same class. Uh, we went over that diagram briefly just to reiterate. Client, someone browsing the internet, the internet itself, server. We talked about static pages, that is pages that don't change. Plain old HTML pages are pre-written and are sitting out there waiting. And the server's job is real easy. When the client makes a request for a static page, the server simply grabs it and delivers it. Dynamic pages are a lot more involved. Dynamic pages typically work in conjunction with a database. And there are not finished HTML pages. There are server-side programs or depending on, on the, the particular language, sometimes they're described as server-side scripts. And the user input that comes from the user via the form is a key component in the server processing the database and the scripts to pull the information that you want. So for example, Google would have a script that knows how to search for a search term. Google would have a database of the trillion sites that are on the internet. Google then takes your input, uh, input applies its magical algorithm, all right, uh, it, its script, its process for looking through the database and finding the best matches. And th that is relayed back to the um, client in, in, in the form of an HTML page. Important thing to realize, again, is regardless of whether you're talking static or dynamic pages, what gets delivered back to the client is an HTML page. HTML or XHTML. Um, I'm using those sort of interchangeably here. Because that's what browsers understand. Browsers don't understand the server-side languages. I don't believe last time I talked at all about what the server-side languages are. All right? Server-side languages are things such as, you might hear people talk about PHP or Perl or Ruby or Python, or ASP.NET, or Java as distinct from JavaScript, and so on. And what do those scripts look like? Well, let's see if we can Google a sample PHP script. That might be simpler to look at than a, a .NET script. not good.
Oh, you know what? I have code from my class here. We'll just look at one of those examples. I guess this will work as well as any. This is a PHP script, and it includes HTML code, JavaScript code that we'll talk about a little bit, probably starting next week, and it includes these blocks of PHP code. These blocks of PHP code is what actually grabs the, imp now this particular one doesn't, but other examples, or what actually grabs the input, does its thing with it, searches a database, etc., and comes up with the HTML. So if you notice that it's a mix of plain old HTML that we've learned in this class and code that PHP runs and outputs. So PHP will output different stuff depending on the user parameters. So really, you know, learning HTML is a great jumping off point to learn these other server-side languages because the goal of those other server-side languages is to output HTML. And in fact, a lot of the contents of those other languages is just plain HTML along with some other stuff to, to add the dynamic aspect to it. Alright, so where we left off last time was we had a form. And this is a simple form, and it doesn't do anything yet. Let's make it bigger. And this is a text box and a submit button. All right, two of the form controls that we're going to use. Now, this form isn't hooked up to anything. Um, forms are typically, again, hooked up to server-side scripts that process that. Now, we don't study the creation of server-side scripts in this class, so we have to use someone else's. And we're going to use Google's server-side script for doing a search. Um, I have in Angel a neat little resource that tells you how to write a form that connects to Google server. And let's take a look at that for a second and we'll take and we'll use that code in this example. Under the resource section Adding Google search to a site. So I'm going to go and edit my web page. I'm going to be sure to put a credit on my web page. think it's important to do. We can't stress this enough. I've heard it said that, that students are growing up and going through high school and even some in college without realizing that you can't simply just copy and paste stuff from anywhere into your paper. That, that that's a form of plagiarism. So I try to at every opportunity Make sure we reinforce the concept of citing your sources. So if you borrow code from somewhere, um, you know, put, put a little message on there. So that's what I'm doing here. All right, let's look at this page. We'll see a couple of new attributes 
to our form tag. Whoops. There's a method and an action. All right. The method and the action is what sort of wires this to the server side script. All right. The user interface, you know, the, the page with the form, the user interface, sometimes called the front end because that's what the user sees. All right, and sort of behind the scenes at the back end is the back end processing that takes it and manipulates it that the user doesn't see. But the method and the action are the things that wire this form to, um, to, to the server side script. There's two choices for the method, get and post. All right. The get and post method, the difference between the two is how the data is passed from the client to the server. With the get method, we'll actually be able to see the data being passed because it will, it will become part of the URL. All right? It will become part of the URL. With post, you don't see the data. The data isn't visible. It gets passed as part of the HTTP request that's made, but it happens sort of behind the scenes and you don't see the data. If you were doing something like submitting a password, you might want to use uh, post instead of get so that the, the password wouldn't be visible on the URL. That would be one example. And there's other examples as well. For this class, we're going to use get probably all the time. Maybe I'll do one quick example with post just to show you the difference. But we're going to use get because that will allow us to actually see the data get passed. All right. And lastly, we have the action. The action is the name of the script that we want to call. And the name of the script that we want to call is called HTTP slash slash www.google.com slash search. All right. Again, this isn't on our web server, so we have to put the full path to it. We have to put HTTP and the domain and, and the path to that. All this is is a file that lives on Google server. All right. And it's called search. Um, that's a script in whatever language Google uses, PHP, Perl, Python, whatever, that Google uses, it's going to take our input and do its thing to it. So let's add these two things. Let's actually just copy this form tag and put it into, remember I said leave a blank space? Well, now we're going to fill in that blank space because our form tag is going to have a method and it's going to have an action. Now normally, in most applications, you're writing both the HTML page and the script to process the code. You're doing all of it, right? In which case you would know the name to set the action because you're the one that made up that program or made up that script. In the case of Google though, we have to rely on what they called it. So we have to call it what they called it. All right? Uh, again, if you were doing this all by yourself, you'd get to pick these names, but we have to call everything by the terms that Google uses it so it matches up right. And the script that we want to call is this, google.com slash search. Now, this name is not a coincidence either, Q. Why do we use the name Q here? We use the name Q because... That's what Google's expecting at its end. How do we know it? Well, you can do a little reverse engineering and, and test it. Just take my word for it that Q is, an, is the name that we want to be sure that our search term is called. That's the name of the search term that we want to call. All right. So let's go and save this now. And our form should actually do something instead of just sitting there looking at us. So if I go and I type HTML and click Go, it takes me to Google's result page and shows me HTML. 
All right. How did it do that? Well, let's look at this URL more closely. What does that correspond to in the form? That's the action of the form, right? We said the action of the form is the name of the script on the server side that um, is going to process this form. All right? So again, the, the author of that article did some reverse engineering and found that this is the name of the script we want to call. So that's the URL that got called. That's the web page that got called. Notice what's after the URL though. There's a question mark. And then there are pairs of things. There's two pairs of things. One of them is Q equals HTML. The other is btn submit equals go. The pairs are, are, are separated by an ampersand. And again, this is where uh, some of you have gotten into uh, difficulty with ampersands in your validation. All right, uh, This is where they come from. Ampersands are used to separate items on what's called the query string. What is the query string? The query string is everything after the question mark. All right, And what does that correspond to? That corresponds to the data that we're passing to the server. All right, It's our query. It's the question we're asking the server. All right. Now where have we seen the names Q and BTN submit before? Yeah. If we look at, at our page, Q is the name of the text box. BTN submit is the name of our submit button. So these names come from the names of the things on my form. All right. So if we look at my form, my text box is called name. So on the query string, it's going to have, I'm sorry, the text box isn't called name. <laughs> the text box name is called Q. The text box's name is Q. Therefore, if we look at the query string, we see Q equals, and what's contained in there? What I typed in the query string. What I typed in, I'm sorry, what I typed in the text box. That gets put on the query string. BTN submit indicates that's the name of the submit button, and its value is go. All right? That's another way of saying, hey, this person entered in HTML on the, uh, in the text box named Q and pressed the submit button. All right, that's all that that says, that this person um, entered in a value of HTML in the text box called Q and pressed the submit button. So now, because we played by the rules, all right, Google knows what to do with it. All right, our two key things are getting the action right and getting the name right of the different form fields. Because if we get the action right, we're going to call the right script on that end. If we then get the name of the fields right, then that script at that end is going to know where to find all the data and going to be able to pull all the data and do whatever processing it, it, it does. Let's go in and do another search. Oops. If I click back and I do a search for CSS. All right. And I click go. There did a search on CSS for it. Notice the difference of the query string. How do we expect the query string to be different in this case? Yeah. Whoops. Our value for Q is no longer HTML, but it's CSS. Okay? So, we get our results based on the fact that we typed in CSS based, uh, rather than HTML. 
the button submit still has a value of go because we still click the submit button. That's essentially what btn submit equals go means, that we've, collect, we've clicked the submit button. Other questions or questions about this? Now again, this is a very special case. We know what the script is uh, on Google's end and we know the values that it's expecting. All right. Um, if we were doing this uh, in a more typical project, we would have created that server-side script as well or someone on our team would have created it and then would have to find out from them what script we're supposed to call and what are the names of the values. Just to show you the difference, Let's change the method from get to post. And let's see if it still works. Okay. So if I change the method to post, let's say I do a search for PHP. Ah. the request method post is inappropriate for the URL slash search. All right. I didn't follow the rules. Therefore, it, it busted me. <laughs> All right. And it didn't do its thing. It didn't process it. But a key thing to notice is, notice the URL now. Oops. The URL doesn't contain any of those form fields. And um, because I used the post method and, and those values got passed another way. But that script isn't expecting it to be posted. It's expecting the get method to be used. Therefore, the script doesn't do what it's supposed to. So again, we have to follow the rules. We have to give the server-side script what it's expecting. And in this case, we know that that script, google.com slash search, we now know that we have to make our method get and we have to put whatever we're searching in something named Q. All right. Now, the example that I posted to Angel adds a second form control. And that is It adds a checkbox. And what's that checkbox for? That checkbox allows me to only search one particular site. Right? So for example, a normal Google search searches the entire web. Right? We may want to not search the entire web, but search one particular site. And in his case, he's putting in a value of that of Dave Taylor. All right. So, let's go and let's see how this works. I go in and I type HTML and I don't check that checkbox. All right. I do the search. Oh, I forgot to change the method back to, to get. It searched the entire internet. Because it said, um, you know, this site's from W3 Schools, this site's from Wikipedia, and so on down the line. Now watch what happens if I check the checkbox. Every single one of these entries is from Dave Taylor's website. So let's look how that's accomplished. First of all, let's look at the code for a checkbox. The code for a checkbox is still input type equals 
uh, it's still an input tag, right? But instead of the type being text, the type equals checkbox. All right? That's what makes it a checkbox instead of a text box. The name is site search. All right? So, let's look at the URL here. What do we see? We see on the URL site search equals AskDaveTaylor.com. All right. So, whoever wrote this knows that Google is expecting, if you want to limit to one specific site, Google's expecting that on the query string and it's expecting it called site search. All right. So, again, some reverse engineering, it knows that site search is the proper name to make that checkbox. The value of the checkbox is the value that that name is going to get if the checkbox is checked. And in this case, it's Ask Dave Taylor. All right. So, let's watch this. Oops. If I check the checkbox, the URL is this. All right. Since I've checked the checkbox, site search appears on the URL, and askdavetaylor.com is the value, because that's the value of the checkbox. What if I don't check that? If I don't check that, and it goes and searches the entire internet, all right, notice what the URL is. URL is going to look a little different. Site search isn't there at all. Okay. What's the lesson here? That with a checkbox, if it's checked, you get the value of the, the name and the value of the checkbox on the query string only if it's checked. If it's not checked, you don't get anything. All right. You don't get anything if it's not checked. All right. Questions at this point? I'm going to make a couple variations of this form. Remember I said you could have several forms on the same page. All right. So just for a learning uh, exercise, I'm going to make several variations of this form. Let me copy. I'll call this one text box and check box. Actually, let's make this an H2. question. With this checkbox, remember, the checkbox is a yes or no question. All right. So, how could I make this? So, so right now, with that checkbox, I can either search the entire web or I can search Dave Taylor's site. All right. How could I change this so that I could choose which site I wanted to search? and put the name of any site on the internet. And put another text box, right. So I could go, and I'm going to do this, and I'll make two text boxes. What's that other text box's name going to be? It's going to be Site Search. Why? Because that's how Google is expecting the data to come across. 
So I could say input type equals text, name equals site search. I could give it a value, I could, and that value is going to become the default value, but I could change that default value. All right. So let's try this one, and let's do the second form in this case. Here's my two text boxes. Search text box is the same. The second one is a text box, and notice it defaulted to a name, or a, I'm sorry, a value of Ask Dave Taylor. Why is that? Because that's the value of the text box. The value for the text box means the default. Let's search Lorraine Community College's website for anything about HTML. All right, and there, all the results on this page come from lccc.edu. All right, so I just change again as long as I'm following the rules. All that script knows is it wants if you want to do a search of the internet. Uh, I'm sorry, if you want to do a search not of the internet but of a specific page, all it knows is it wants that called site search. What happens if I don't put anything in there? Then I'm back to my search of the internet. Now, let's look at some other form controls now. So now we can, we can search two different ways. We've, we've done it with two text boxes. We've done it with a text box and a check box. Let's do it with radio buttons. Okay? Let's do it with radio buttons. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to do a search. And this is going to be a text box and radio button. Radio buttons have a type of radio. The name is going to be site search again. Why? Because that's the name that the script is expecting. Um, I'm going to put three radio buttons in. I'm going to allow the user to choose, and I'm going to do something I almost never do, use break tags, just in the interest of time. I'm going to allow the user to choose between, do they want to search Dave Taylor's site, do they want to search LC's site, or do they want to search W3C's site. So I'm going to duplicate this a couple more times. Now, notice each of those radio buttons has the same name. All right? Each radio button has the same name. Why do you think that's so? Why do they all have the same name? Right. Because this is what makes them a radio button group. Remember the way a radio button works is that only one of the options can be selected. And therefore, um, by, by making them all the same name, if I select one, it will unselect the other one. How will it know what value to put on the query string for site search? Whichever value is associated with the one that's clicked. So, for example, if I click on the first radio button, it's going to search 
AskDaveTaylor.com because that's what's going to get put on the query string um, if that one's selected. If I select the second one, this will be put on the query string. If I put the third, pick the third one, that will be put on the query string. All right. Yes. Do you always have to have a value, or can you leave that blank? Um, you could leave it blank. Um, Again, depending on the situation, you could leave it blank, or you could say value equals, and then just two quotes next to each other, indicating that. So that's a possibility. So let's go and look at this one now. Save it. Now I have a choice of a text box and a radio button. So I can look for CSS on W3 schools and click go. And it will give me CSS and all of these results are from W3 schools. If we look at the query string, the query string here says site search equals W3 schools. Why? Because I selected the last radio button, and what's the value associated with the last bot radio button? W3 schools. If I click that and click go, I'm back to searching Dave Taylor. If I click this one and go, I'm back to searching um, the entire web. To answer your question, I could do that here, right? Because we've observed that if you want to search the entire web, you leave that blank. So I could do this. Search entire web value equals nothing. All right. Save, refresh. Then if I click that, I pass nothing on there. And I'm searching the entire web. I get CSS from every site that's listed. Yeah, it did. Because strictly speaking, um, strictly speaking, having a value of, n of nothing is not the same as having no value. All right. Let's see if we, if we eliminate the value altogether, will that work that way? Yeah, see it didn't. So for this one, it's expecting some, some value if you pass that. So, yeah, we have to say value equals empty string. All right. Next thing we're going to look at is a dropdown. Now, dropdown does not use the input tag. The dropdown is actually a, a combination of two tags. One is the select tag, and the other is the option tag. Now, in normal usage, a dropdown only allows the user to select one value. But you actually can configure a dropdown to show multiple values and even to allow the user to select multiple values. Um, but we're going to go with the more typical case, where the, the user can um, select only one value, and it only shows one value at a time. All right. Here's what the select tag looks like. Starts with the select, and we give it a name. Again, since we know that the value of the search site we want to search has to be in a very, uh, uh, on the query string under the name of site search. We're still going to give it the name of site search. And we have our end select tag. We then have a series of options.
And I'll just write a couple of them here on the page. The option consists of two parts. The select wraps up all the options. So everything associated with this field is in one select statement. The option contains two pieces. It contains a value just like the checkbox or the radio button does. And you can, pretty reasonable to say that whatever option is checked, that's the value that's going to get sent to the server. And then between the start and end option tag, you have a descriptive term. All right? Something the user understands. Now, very often, the value is going to be something that the server understands. So it might be some sort of database code. Give me category one. Give me category two, let's say, on an online shopping site. Well, the user doesn't know what category one and two is, so the description for it will be maybe category one is menswear, category two is women's wear. In which case, between the start and an option tag, they'll have the description that's meaningful to the user. Let's go and put in a drop down on this page. Now again, remember, I'm, I'm just putting all these on the same page just so you can sort of look at them side by side. In reality, you wouldn't have six forms all doing the same thing on your, on your site. So. I'm going to put in select name equals site search. Option value equals nothing. Search entire web. The value is what the script is going to see. This text is what the user is going to see. So oftentimes there's sort of a, a, a difference between the two. The, the script needs database ID numbers and, and, and stuff that isn't necessarily intelligible to a, to a user. And the user needs stuff like descriptive information. What does that part number mean? All right? That might not be terribly useful to the script. All right? So this is sort of how that is handled. The value is what gets sent to the script. The code between the start and end tag is the, 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 is, is the description that the user is going to see. So I'll go in here and I will pick, I'll add the other ones.
All right. So now there's the drop down. We have our search term and we have our drop down to search the entire web. If we click on this, we see we have a list and what we're seeing there is the value between the start and an option tag. Remember, that's the descriptive information, that which the user is going to understand. So I can pick that and I can search uh, PHP, let's say, on Learning Community College's site, click go, and notice what got passed on the query string is not the text that the user saw, but the value of the option that was selected. So in that way, both the people and the script get what they need. People get the, the, something that's descriptive so that they understand what that option means. The script gets the value that it needs to do its job. Now, we can put defaults in here, right? Let's look at defaults for a second. Oops. Let me close this and let me open it up fresh. All right, this one has no default for the, the, the text box and no default for the check box. This one has a default for the text box. How did we accomplish that? We accomplished that by giving the text box a value. A value for the text box becomes its default value. The default for this checkbox is unchecked. All right. If you don't do anything, that's what the default is going to be. If you want to make the default checked, all right, what you do is you say checked equals checked. I know that's weird, but you say it that way. And now, when we visit the page, Oops. By default, that option is checked. Radio buttons are the same way. Let's say this one I want to default to W3 schools. Again, if I don't specify a radio button, none of them are checked. If I want to specify one, as being the default, let's say on this one I want to make W3 schools the default, I'll say, whoops, again, checked equals checked. And now, if I go and visit that, notice that third option is the, the one that's checked, the default. Now I can certainly change it, but again, by default, uh, it will be. A drop down, a drop down, if I don't specify otherwise, the default is the top value of the list, the top option. If I wanted to make something else the default, oddly enough, I don't say checked equals checked. But I say selected equals selected. Oops. So now in that drop down, the default is Lorain County Community College's site. Now, when do you pick a drop down? You pick a drop down, or I'm sorry, when do you pick a default value for something? How do you do it? You put a default value when you think it makes sense for your users to have a default value. For example, if I was doing a 
uh, tuition calculation program. The choices uh, for tuition are in county, in, uh, in county, in state, or out of state. All right. Most people that go to LC live in, in county. So it might make sense to make in county the default. All right. But if I had an option for major, let's say, um, and I had a series of radio buttons, I wouldn't necessarily want to default one of them because you probably couldn't say that one major has most of the people here on campus. You know, the majors are, are split. You know, there may be one major that's bigger than another major, but it's not so popular as to justify making it the default. So I would not pick a default. All right. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do in HTML to keep someone from submitting a form before they've entered all the values in. That will take JavaScript to do. All right. Um, Monday of next week, we'll polish off a couple of extra form things beyond this. This covers most of what we need to know about forms, but we'll talk about a couple other things dealing with forms on Monday. We'll also talk about accessibility issues with forms and styling of forms. All right. I'm not sure how long that will take. Depending on the time, we will then start into mobile and JavaScript stuff next week. All right. That's all I had. We'll, we'll see you up in lab.